Before we get uh, started, I would like to acknowledge that um, uh, Carlton University is located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. And thus, uh, Carlton uh, acknowledges it, it has a responsibility uh, to the Algonquin people and the responsibility to adhere to Algonquin cultural uh, protocols. Now, uh, this event, it's, it's uh, very close to my heart. It's very, a very interesting topic. Uh, and uh, in a minute, I will, I will thank uh, the organizers for, for being able to put such a great panel together. Uh, but I would like to mention that this is a second panel of the Transatlantic Trade Policy, Environmental Issues and Climate Change Workshop Series that is uh, organized over a period of three weeks. Um, this workshop uh, series is part of Carlton uh, Faculty of Public Affairs Research Series and it's hosted as an uh, activity of the uh, Jean Monnet Network on Transatlantic Trade Politics. With the support of the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union, Carlton University and the four universities that are uh, network partners, um, University of Antwerp, Bates College, Paris Lodron University of Salzburg and, uh, and University of Warwick. This specific uh, workshop series uh, is co-organized by um, project partners at Carlton and Paris Lodron University of Salzburg. And I would certainly like to um, acknowledge the important role of two of my colleagues in the organization of these uh, events, uh, Professor John de Bardeleben from Carlton University and um, uh, Professor Gabriel Spielker from University of Constance. I think they are both here with us. Uh, congratulations on putting together very interesting uh, three panels on, on this intersection between trade and, and environmental uh, issues. Um, if the last week we, we were joined by, by three experts from uh, Canada and, and Europe that discussed the impact of, of uh, domestic environmental and climate policies on cross-border competitiveness and trade agreements, this week we are joined by um, three experts from North America and Europe that will look at the role of WTO, World Trade Organization, and the dispute settlement mechanism um, uh, in dealing with possible clashes between uh, uh, trade and environmental uh, rules. We are also joined by one of our uh, network uh, colleagues, uh, Professor Dirk de Bievre from uh, University of Antwerp, who will provide uh, a brief discussion of the main arguments that are brought in by, by the three experts in the, in the opening uh, remarks. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, to introduce uh, uh, each speaker in the order of speaking. Um, and uh, yes, so we'll, in terms of administrative or the structure of, of the event, each speaker has about uh, 15 minutes for opening remarks, followed by, by the discussion comments. And after we'll have plenty of time for, for a Q&A. And you are certainly encouraged to ask your question uh, in, directly in the chat or by, by raising your small electronic hand. So I start with our first speaker, uh, Dr. Steve Charnovitz, who teaches at uh, George Washington University Law School and writes on international trade, international law, uh, US foreign relations law, and environmental sustainability. Uh, Professor Charnovitz serves uh, or had served on the editorial boards of the World Trade Review, uh, Cosmopolis, a review of cosmopolitics, journal environment and development, and so on. And he's a member of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations and the American Law Institute. Professor Chernovic is the author and co-author or co-editor of four books and over 210 articles, essays, or book reviews. And he's admitted to the bar in New York and District of Columbia, and is a member of the bar of the US Court of International Trade, the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, and the US Supreme Court. Uh, today, Professor Chernovitz will address uh, the issues uh, uh, the set of an environmental agenda for the World Trade Organization. So, Professor Chernovitz, say the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so, I'm delighted to speak with you today from uh, George Washington University during this uh, multi day conference on transatlantic trade policy, environmental issues, and climate change. Back in 1794, George Washington helped to inaugurate transatlantic trade law with the Jay Treaty. 
Now, this is an interdisciplinary and interuniversity conference. My scholarship is in legal science, and I want to present on the role of the World Trade Organization with special attention to environmental law and climate change. But before doing so, let me give a digital fist bump to my fellow panelists, Christian and Kyla, and to the discussant, Dirk, and the moderator, Prina. So the title of my presentation is the WTO as an environmental agency revisited. And I will offer three main points. First, the world trading system has made great progress in how it interacts with environmental issues. Since I first began writing about these issues in the run up to the UN Conference on Environment and Development of 1992. Second, assigning important environmental problems to the WTO will often not be a good idea because the WTO is dysfunctional and because environmental problems should be solved in environmental regimes. And then third, transatlantic cooperation has a potential for achieving better outcomes on regional and global issues of trade. And here I mean politically broad cooperation that should include the USMCA countries, the EU, the UK, Switzerland, and Norway. So that's a lot to cover in 12 minutes. Let me try to do it. First, it's important to recognize the WTO's environmental progress. Before the advent of the WTO, the GATS normative and legal stance on the environment was to use some legal precision, awful. But the jurists prudence improved in the WTO, especially because of the appellate body, which gave a sophisticated and pragmatic interpretation of the environmental exceptions in GATT Article 20 and a highly textured balanced judgment in the Canada feed-in tariff case. The WTO has also improved its openness compared to the untransparent GATT. Second, let me turn to what the role of the WTO should be regarding the environment and climate. Back in 2008, I wrote a futuristic essay for the United Nations University titled, The WTO as an Environmental Agency. I sought to explore what it would mean for the WTO to be reconsidered to be an environmental agency rather than just a trade agency. At that time, 2008, my daring scholarly effort to reimagine a greener WTO was well outside of the trade policy mainstream. 13 years ago, the WTO had much less pretension to assign itself an environmental mission than the WTO seems to have in 2021. Today, the mainstream views around the WTO seem comfortable with the idea that the WTO should play an active role in promoting the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. In Geneva, we've seen the TESSD, the Trade and Environment Structure Discussions among WTO member group. In Brussels, we've recently seen the Trade Commissioner call for a new coalition of trade ministers to take concerted action on climate goals. Among the many issues that insiders have urged trade ministers and or the WTO to solve include setting carbon pricing, managing fishery subsidies, reducing the use of plastics, and managing fossil fuel subsidies. So perhaps I should be satisfied that my 2008 vision of the WTO transforming itself into an environmental agency is now conventional wisdom. Have I not succeeded? Actually, I'm not happy with the current debate. And that's because the realism of 2021 collides with my idealism of 2008. To be sure, undertaking effective global action on climate change, fisheries, and plastics are all the worthy goals for global governance but I'm skeptical that assigning or reassigning these tasks to the WTO will lead to better outcomes that we all seek. More likely, an enhanced WTO role will prove counterproductive. After all, 
since 1995, none of the WTO's environmental negotiations have succeeded. The most important negotiations in the Doha round were to liberalize trade in environmental goods and services and to control fishery subsidies. Zero for two on those two goals. So today, based on the WTO's own track record of failure, the WTO should not be relied upon for success for success by environmentalists in a new broader mission. Equally important, by assigning environmental problems to the trade regime, one weakens the aspirations and integrity of the environmental regimes with the jurisprudence with the jurisdictional competence and the technical expertise to broker solutions. As a place to locate negotiations, the WTO is also inferior to environmental regimes, such as the UNFCCC, because the WTO is less transparent and lacks byways for business and NGO participation that exist in the Climate Change Convention. Why not instead seek to address climate problems in the climate regime and address fishery problems in the fishery regimes and plastic problems in the, within the UN Environmental Program, UNEP. Don't encourage dis disintermediation by the WTO because that will just make things worse for the planet. For fisheries, the classic market failure of overfishing requires better transborder fisheries regulation. Oversubsidization is one small piece of the fisheries problem. The bigger problems exist in the many market and government failures that characterize national and international fisheries conservation. We need better regimes, including the UN FAO re regime on illegal unreported unregulated, that is IUU fishing. For climate, the Paris Agreement fails to address responsibility for the carbon footprint of imports and exports. That was a flaw in the Paris Agreement, but that normative flaw cannot be fixed by the WTO. It needs to be fixed in the Paris Agreement. Moreover, there is a vital independent reason against WTO mission creep. The inherent treaty-based mission of the WTO to liberalize trade and manage trade relations remains a job that only the WTO can do. Don't give the WTO an excuse to avoid its real job, which is so important for the world economy. Only the WTO can address the worsening of UPID. UPID are the trade practices of unilateralism, protectionism, isolationism, and discrimination. UIPD is what the WTO needs to focus on. Now for my third and last point. Transatlantic cooperation on both environmental and trade issues should be stepped up. Many problems of market failure or government failure are amenable to solutions adopted in transatlantic law and in existing or new transatlantic institutions. The transatlantic arena has successes in CTA, CETA and in NAFTA USMCA, but the transatlantic region could be improved by absorbing the lessons from the Pacific in RCEP, RCEP and CPTPP. There is also a possibility the transatlantic countries could form a new coalition for progress at the WTO to help the WTO achieve successful multilateral negotiations on trade and development at MC12. Speaking from Washington, DC, I wish I could predict that the United States is going to step up to be a leading negotiator in a coalition of transatlantic countries, a coalition of transatlantic countries and at the WTO. And perhaps a future will come when I will be able to honestly say that the US will be playing a constructive role. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. I think these were great uh, opening remarks and uh, open the stage for a for an important uh, debate. So uh, we are continuing now with uh, Dr. Christian Haberly, has been who was a fellow of the World Trade Institute from Bern University since 2007, and is a consultant for scientific research and uh, outreach activities in Europe, Asia, Africa, and in the Americas. He has produced over 60 publications on trade and investment issues related to agriculture, food security and food safety, obesity and malnutrition, water, climate change, employment, multilateral and regional trade and development. I would also like to, to mention that uh, Professor Haberly was a trade negotiator for Switzerland in the GATT and the WTO during the Uruguay and the Doha rounds. He was also a chair of the WTO Committee on Agriculture and the WTO panelist um, from 1996-2015 in 20 stages of five dispute settlements cases. He also served as chair of the Joint Committee of the Agriculture Agreement Switzerland-EU from 2002 to 2007. So uh, Professor Haberly will, will discuss about the carbon border adjustment mechanism and the WTO role. Thank you, Krina and Dirk, for hosting us virtually at Carleton University and for chairing and discussing this second panel meeting. Thank you, Gabby, for inviting me as a WTI colleague of old to this reunion of outliers. When you met in the first panel last week, there were five hours teaching at Trapka in uh, Arusha, Tanzania, but I did read uh, the abstracts for all three meetings, and this is what made me call this a reunion of outliers. I do think the common denominator we all have is a concern that fiddling on the roof in Glasgow, while Rome and Canada are burning and California is flooding, will no longer do. Indeed, we all are addressing the multilateral and regional trading uh, system from the scholarly outside, and this is the role academia can and must play in the hope that trade and climate delegates on both sides of the Atlantic are listening. But are they listening? I think yes. Just two weeks ago, top level EU and US delegations met to sort out the possibilities for a new chapter in their trans transatlantic trade policies. They were mindful of the impact of a common approach could have for the ultimate challenges, not only for a new TTIP, but also as a way of dealing with the present pandemic, with China, saving the WTO and planet Earth. As far as I know, they did not discuss the reasons for the failure of TTIP. They preferred to fly over the fact that car makers across the Atlantic never agreed on a common standard for screen wipers. Nor did they wonder why after 12 or 14 ministerial meetings, societal concerns still prevent consensus on what trade lawyers in the US call science-based facts, allowing for GMO corn or growth hormones for cows and pigs. But where did they meet? They met at the universities of Johns Hopkins and Georgetown. In the perfect pandemic storm, four key summits are taking place in the second half of this year. Two at the UN, the Food Systems SDG Show, followed by the G20 this month and the WTO Ministerial Conference number 12 in December. But as far as my crystal ball goes, only the G20 is likely to celebrate what is already called a landmark deal, the global minimum corporate tax of 15% initiated by the OECD. It obliges or allows about 150, 140 countries to raise tax or on sales made by multinationals within their borders as of 2023. These new rules will limit the race to the bottom on tax without ending tax competition. On the other side, the Food System Summit on 23 September went kind of unnoticed, perhaps conveniently hiding the fact that we will not reach the SDG by 2030, let alone end hunger as all states are committed to doing together. This also makes it easier to take one example where I researched for 10 years to forget global food security and to more than reiterate the wish for a tiny improvement of CAD Article 11. 
I'm referring to the countless G8, G7, G20 meetings, which decided what the W General Council has failed to adopt and is unlikely to do either at MC12. This is a prohibition of export restrictions for food aid. Absurd, no? But finally, turning to global warming and trade, I am, am I a Cassandra to predict that trade matters, let alone environmental and climate concerns, will not make any headway when the leaders of the world meet at COP26? And that MC12 will again close its eyes to the existential crisis of the jewel of the crown, let alone adopt a new agreement against IUU fishing. Steve is more positive here. So what about the topic I proposed to Gabriele for my input today? CBAM versus trade rules. Or should we rather call it a transatlantic topic called USI versus EU? As long as only the EU wants to tax both local and imported CO2. Where to start with what indeed might remain an impasse total for a long time to come? In three virtual bullet points, let's listen to The Economist first for a change. And then hear what the European Commission and some of its member states want before asking a legal authority of the first order. Point one, everybody with a sense of economics and aware of the now most important issue for humankind loves taxing CO2. Even free traders and multinational corporations and insurance companies agree, of course, only if no competitor gets away with loopholes. For instance, Mario Greco, the CEO of Zurich Insurance, says that its company was among the first not to insure coal mines. Imagine <clears throat> all major insurers and reinsurance companies follow suit. Nobody can produce coal without insurance or a very expensive state guarantee. Greco also says that producers of cement, aluminium and chemicals should pay for their CO2 emissions the sooner the better, because such a tax would automatically accelerate the expensive greening of heavy industries. Point two, this leads me to the plans in the European Union and France to choose two extremes for taxing not only domestic CO2, but also the greenhouse gas content of imports. Again, economists applaud carbon leakage, the term you know, that means investment dislocation out of Europe, follows when governments apply self-discriminatory taxes only to the uh, domestic industries. Mind you, the OECD has offered to help here too, but without providing any details on how to bridge this transatlantic mindset gap. You probably know what Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced with great grand fanfare on 14 July, for, I quote, the transformation of the EU economy and crucial to Europe, becoming the world's first climate neutral continent by 2050, and for society to meet climate ambitions, hmm. unquote. A very ambitious package of measures, which includes a new CBAM, carbon water adjustment measure, putting a carbon price on imports of a targeted selection of products, cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertilizer, and electricity. In order to ensure that ambitious climate action in Europe does not lead to carbon leakage. It also phases out free emission allowance for aviation, following the global carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation called Corsia, and to include shipping emissions for the first time in the EU ETS. You all presumably wish the EU Commission good luck. <laughs> perhaps you did not follow the very interesting online for French ministers in Paris with two EU commissioners, World Bank, OECD, diplomats from New Zealand and top class academics attending. A lot of cautionary comments from Brussels to Washington and back to the OECD in Paris, in Paris disagreed with the minister Bruno Le Maire calling for, and I quote, a reindustrialisation de la France. Economists will shudder here, right? <laughs> Former WT ambassador for New Zealand, the brilliant diplomat Angelis Vitalis, couldn't approve either what would amount to a punishment for long distance transport. But Vitalis conveniently forgot to mention New Zealand's erstwhile announcement to include a CO2 tax 
on dairy exports in New Zealand's nationally determined contribution, under Paris. That commitment has since disappeared from the list of New Zealand's pledges under the Paris Climate Convention. And no other country has so far included agricultural policy measures in its NDCs. And nobody in Paris or in Geneva has acknowledged the incompatibility we have between the wholly non-discrimination rule of the WTO and the differentiation commitment of the Paris Convention. Finally, while the Commission does warn of the social cost of climate change mitigation in Europe, only scholars seem to have realized that the uneven impact of CBAM within the European Green Deal also require investment support, for instance, for African countries to address their vulnerabilities and increase resi resilience. Point three, now who is my trade lawyer on this question of CBAM? Well, a few tentative assessments on the EU's plans exist, as well as on similar schemes, for instance, in a part of Canada, California, or Vermont. Back in 2012, Joshua Meltzer had doubts on the EU Aviation Directive's compatibility with WTO rules. In 2015, Felicity Dean warned against emissions trading schemes without WTO law compatibility. But my authority today is Lauren Bartels from Cambridge who in 2012 wrote the devastating legal opinion for GG trade in respect of the EU's decision to extend its ETS to aviation. He showed that border carbon adjustments varying with transport distances may, might not withstand a WTO legal challenge. He also demonstrated that the EU scheme violated its international civil aviation obligations under the Chicago Convention after it had failed to obtain an international agreement on an aviation ETS within the framework of the International Civil Aviation Organization. So that story went as li like that. All planes landing in the EU were to pay a tax depending on the length of travel, meaning emission of CO2. Laurent argued that this was not only contrary to the Chicago Convention, but also to gather Article 3.2 and other WTO provisions. Even though both the European Council and Parliament had adopted this proposal, the EU had to suspend Cinedie, this climate-friendly measure by which all airlines, regardless of their origin, would have had to acquire and surrender to the EU allowances for the CO2 emissions produced by their aircraft, dead before arrival. But nevertheless, resurrected by van der Leyen last uh, month, without obviously better survival chances, apparent, especially if the Biden and Harris administration continues to disagree. I come to my conclusions. The main problem for climate smart policies is the non-discrimination obligation of like products, which differ only in respect of their carbon footprint embedded according to different production and processing methods, PPM. You all know the acronym. For instance, a BAM on imported commodities produced with a high greenhouse gas output cannot exceed taxes applied to, and I quote, the like domestic product or in respect of an article from which the imported product has been manufactured or produced in whole or in part, end of quote, and that's from Article 2 to A of the GATT. You all know how the likeness test generally applied in W2 disputes works until today. Well, without boasting personal merits, I think the only dispute settlement panel ever to accept the defense in GATT Article 20 for the protection of credibly alleged environmental concerns is the December 2020 ruling on Ukraine's export ban for rare wood species, adopted under my chairmanship, but strongly criticized by GG Trade as the complaining party. Actually, in my own publications, I've argued uh, that WTO condones child labor and deforestation of the Amazon, and thus contravenes used Kogan's commitments enshrined in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. But the fact that no WTO ruling ever put public international law before WTO law is besides my topic today. Even scholars, especially white old men, took a long time to find especially 
the climate problem of those infamous PPM. In her work on the trade elements in countries' climate contributions under the Paris Agreement in 2017, Clara Brandy noted a particular difficulty for a legal assessment of the so-called non-product-related PPMs, which leave no trace in the final product. She rightly pointed out that the multilateral trading system does not make a clear distinction between products solely based on their levels of emitted carbon. Whether such products can be considered unlike has never been settled in a WTO legal dispute. An iconoclastic remark perhaps is the absence of a good dispute settlement system at the WTO, an opportunity for the EU to proceed with what climate activists would then call good protectionism. My own view for this dilemma is that global warming will not wait for WTO members to sort out the mess which colorblind trade ministries choose to ignore. Way before Donald Trump and Robert Lighthizer sabotaged the dust DSU, initiated a trade war with China, and celebrated steel tariffs as an easy gift to the inefficient domestic components of the steel products value chain. And my hope is that trade lawyers who still argue that free trade is good for everybody will come out of the ivory tower. It does matter for what product, with what measures, and with which impact on climate and poor developing countries and their vulnerable people. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to join this debate today. Thank you so much. We are very happy that you joined this debate today um, and, and uh, you provided very, very good example of, of uh, issues that uh, you know WTO is not in the position to deal with. Um, so we'll continue now uh, moving to Dr. Kaila Tienhara, uh, who is a professor in the Canada Research Chair in Economy and Environment in the School of Environmental Studies and the Department of Global Development Studies at Queen's University. Her main area of interest are the intersection between environmental governance and the global economic system. Uh, one of her um, re recent work has examined investor state disputes uh, concerning environmental regulations that are brought to international arbitration under bilateral regional investment agreements. And today she will uh, discuss uh, these issues related to investor state dispute settlement raising the cost of climate action. Thank you for organizing this, this great panel. It's a, it's a real privilege to be uh, included with such esteemed scholars. And I, I very much enjoyed hearing those first two, two talks. So um, as we said, I'm going to be speaking about investor state dispute settlement or ISDS. So moving a bit away from the WTO and, and trade regime uh, and how it may impact the energy transition and the cost of climate action. Although of course in the Q&A, we can also discuss how it it affects all other kinds of environmental issues as well. So I'm going to start with just a few basics about the implications of climate science for the fossil fuel sector, but I'm going to go through that pretty quickly because I'm, it's my assumption that probably I'm probably not going to say anything particularly new for this audience. And then I'll spend most of my time on, on ISDS and, and how it affects uh, this area. So my starting point uh, is that we need to keep a lot of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. Uh, because the carbon in those reserves, if burned, would blow our carbon budget and push us well above two or even three degrees of warming. So a recent study by Wellsby et al. in Nature uh, crunched the numbers and determined that the amount that needs to be left in the ground if we are to keep below the 1.5 degree uh, Celsius lower Paris temperature target is widely accepted, uh, which is widely accepted as the one that we should be aiming to stay under, uh, is 89% of coal, 59% of fossil gas, and 58% of oil. That's globally. They also brought it, uh, broke it down by country and region, and I highlighted Canada here. Uh, we would need to leave 83% of our oil, 81% of our fossil gas, and 83% of our coal in the ground to be in line with uh, 1.5. So the idea of unburnable carbon and unextractable uh, reserves logically leads us to the idea of stranded assets. Uh, which are environmentally unsustainable assets that suffer from unanticipated or premature write downs, uh, downward reevaluations, or converted to liabilities. That's from Caldecott AL. In plain English, uh, fossil fuel companies have invested a lot of money in finding coal, oil, and gas reserves, and they have them on the books as delivering profits uh, for long periods into the future. 
Similarly, there's a lot of infrastructure, pipelines, ports, and so forth that is associated with the extraction, transport, and combustion of fossil fuels uh, that will lose value or become worthless in a Paris-aligned world. Importantly, asset stranding can result from a number of factors. Obviously, market forces is a significant one. Uh, for example, the plunge in, in oil prices that occurred last year, a number of carbon majors were forced to write off assets, particularly, again, in places such as the Canadian tar sands, uh, which have uh, very costly extraction. But asset stranding is, um, is also an issue elsewhere. We're talking transatlantic, so also note that earlier this year, Global Energy Monitor released a report suggesting that there was a risk of 87 billion euros of stranded assets in the fossil gas sector. So assets like those in the tar sands that are stranded due to economic forces are not really what I wanna focus on today. Instead, what I'm interested in are assets that are stranded by government action. So in particular, I wanna highlight a couple different types of measures that might lead to asset stranding. So there are restrictions on extraction, such as refusing to issue permits to exploit fossil fuel deposits or canceling exploitation permits that have already been issued or banning certain forms of extraction, such as hydraulic fracturing outright. There are also phase outs or bans on the combustion of fossil fuels, such as the phase out of coal power, uh, the reduction or elimination of fossil fuel subsidies, something that countries keep promising but are failing on, and then also limits on the development of infrastructure such as pipelines and ports. Now, I personally believe that these are the types of policy measures that we need to see more of if we're going to keep below 1.5. Uh, market measures like carbon taxes, which were mentioned uh, in the previous uh, talk, obviously very important, but I just don't think that they're doing enough on their own. Um, so I think we need more supply side measures, but these are very direct measures. And by that, I mean, there's a very clear line that can be drawn from the government action to the negative impact on the owner of the asset. And that means that there's more likely to be calls from asset owners for compensation from the government. And this is where international investment law comes in. So there are over 2,600 uh, international investment treaties worldwide. Most of these are bilateral investment treaties, but there are also plurilateral trade agreements that have an investment chapter, uh, the most famous being the, the now ended North American Free Trade, Free, Free Trade Agreement or NAFTA. Uh, that's been replaced by the USMCA, which doesn't have a standard investment chapter, which we'll get back to later. It's also the aforementioned Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP, uh, which may be expanded if, if China is permitted to join. And then in the transatlantic, um, area, we have the Canada-Europe deal known as CETA. Also importantly, there is a, a treaty that wasn't very well known uh, up until very recently called the Energy Charter Treaty or ECT, which covers most of Europe, but also Japan and a few other countries. And it's notable for uh, being almost ex being exclusively focused on the energy sector. And it also may be the first large investment treaty to be canceled over climate concerns. Uh, and I can talk more about that in the Q&A if anyone is interested. So basically all of these treaties um, protect foreign investments uh, and investors from things like direct and indirect expropriation. They require that states provide so-called fair and equitable treatment, uh, most favored nation treatment and national treatment. Um, but importantly, the, the language on these standards is quite vague and open to interpretation. One of the biggest problems has been the requirement for fair and equitable treatment, which has been Interpreted, interpreted by some as meaning that states are essentially required to provide stability from investors and to insulate them from changes in policy. But I think the easiest way to understand how this system works is to look at some examples. Uh, so first up is Westmoreland Coal versus Canada. So a number of years ago, uh, under an NDP government of Rachel Notley, the province of Alberta committed to phasing out coal power uh, by 2030. And because Alberta doesn't really have the infrastructure to export coal, the climate plan also resulted in a de facto phase out of local uh, thermal coal mining. To ensure support for this plan, uh, major utility companies in the province were provided with transition payments to help uh, facilitate the switch to gas and to renewable energy. Uh, the US company Westmoreland did not receive a government handout because it's a coal mining company. Uh, it's not uh, an energy provider. This is where the issue of uh, like, like circumstances comes up in investment, which is sort of similar to what the previous speaker was talking in terms of like products. So that's, uh, that's an issue that's being played out in this case. 
basically Westmoreland thinks it's discriminatory that it didn't uh, get, a, get a payment and it's seeking compensation of a US, US 470 million. Uh, important to understand that it's the federal government, it's Canada that will be liable uh, under NAFTA if this uh, claim is successful. Another uh, coal phase out story, but this time in Europe. So in December, 2019, the Dutch government legislated to ban coal-based power generation by 2030. The action caused a number of companies that uh, own recently built coal power plants to threaten action under the Energy Charter Treaty. A German company called Uniper was the most vocal about this. Um, but then in February of this year, another German company, RWE, uh, launched a case of 1.4 billion. Uh, and, and the spokesman from the company said that the Dutch coal phase out was, quote, not legal because it does not include adequate compensation for this interference with the company's property. That comment about adequate compensation is something that I want you to keep in back of your mind. Who do you think should determine what level of compensation, if any, companies like RWE deserve, given that they have made their investments in full awareness that they contribute to climate change and that the world has to move rapidly away from fossil fuels if we are to avoid catastrophic levels of warming. In April, Uniper also launched another case. Those are both ongoing. Final example for today is the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline. This was a project to bring tar sands petroleum from Alberta through parts of the US. Uh, it was extremely controversial. It was first canceled by President Obama and that sparked a NAFTA dispute and a claim for 15 billion in compensation. Then President Trump came along and reversed the decision and the company moved forward with its plans again. And then in a development that surprised no one except the premier of Alberta, uh, Biden canceled it again. So TC Energy, the Canadian company behind the project has launched a, a NAFTA dispute again for 15 billion. And interestingly, the government of Alberta, which invested quite a bit of public money in the project, uh, seems to be actively involved in that case. Now you may ask yourself, uh, I thought you said NAFTA was over, how can you still launch a, NAF launch a NAFTA case? Uh, and the USMCA doesn't have uh, ISDS in it, uh, at least not between Canadian investors in the US and vice versa. But basically there's an allowance under NAFTA for cases to continue for three years after the official end of the agreement. And these are called legacy disputes. So what actually happens in these cases? Who decides the outcome? It's a panel of three arbitrators, one which is chosen by the state, one by the investor, and a third that is mutually agreed upon. Now, there are serious conflicts of interest that can arise because the individuals that act as arbitrators in one case can act as lawyers for investors in another case. There are also issues with lack of transparency in the process. Another thing that you know, came up in the discussion of the, the trade regime, it's even worse than the investment regime. Proceedings in most cases are not open to the public and documents are not always published. And there are very limited opportunities for third parties such as environmental organizations to intervene in or participate in proceedings in any way. The cost of the proceedings, which can drag on for many years, are also pretty astounding. Five million US is the average cost for states, but there are many cases where governments have spent more in the range of 20 to 40 million. And then if an award is made against the state, there are limited options to challenge it. So no appellate process as there is or was in the WTO. Um, so no possibility for that kind of evolution that we, we heard about the, <laughs> earlier about how the WTO has improved. That's not really uh, possible. And there's a lot of inconsistency in how tribunals interpret the treaties which makes it really difficult for states to predict whether they will be successful in their, in their defense. So fossil fuel companies are frequent users of investor state dispute settlement. Um, I have found 173 cases, but I've recently peer reviewed a more recent report that will come out soon uh, where the author has found quite a few more than that. And you can see on this slide that there are some examples of carbon majors that have been awarded in the range of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in compensation. Um, to be clear, these aren't cases that are challenging climate policies per se, although there are often environmental issues at stake. Uh, for example, Chevron has used arbitration to get out of having to compensate local communities in Ecuador for the impacts of oil pollution. But the point I'm trying to make here is that fossil fuel, fuel companies know how to use this system to their advantage, and I see no reason why they wouldn't use it to resist climate policies. And the other point is that I want to make is that these awards in these cases are insanely high because the system, uh, in this system, investors can claim so-called lost future profits. 
So if a country, for example, decides to ban offshore oil or gas fracking, then companies with planned projects can argue that they should be compensated not just for the money that they had spent developing the project up to that point, their so-called sunk costs, but also for the money that they would have made if the project had proceeded. There are many problems with this approach, uh, one of them being that arbitrators don't have a crystal ball. And we think of things like fossil fuels, who is actually able to predict uh, what the value of a reserve is going to be next year, let alone 20 or 30 years in the future. And are investment arbitrators uh, going to factor in how government action to combat climate change will impact the price of oil or other fossil fuels? Or are they going to continue as they have done so far and assume that prices and profits will continue to rise indefinitely? So to summarize, addressing climate change requires an energy transition that involves rapidly phasing out fossil fuels, and this will create stranded assets. When actions lead to asset stranding, asset owners often seek compensation. If their assets are protected by investment treaties, they can take their claim for compensation to an international tribunal, which may then base the award on wildly speculative notions of lost future profits. So how will this in turn impact the energy transition? There are two major concerns that I have based on my research. The first is what is known as regulatory chill. This is the idea that governments, when they are threatened by, uh, with an IS ISDS case, will reverse course or at least delay action because they're concerned about the cost of defending their policy and arbitration and the possibility of having to pay an investor a large award. Importantly, due to the nature of climate change as a global issue, regulatory chill can also occur across borders. So for example, a government can look at what's happening in the Netherlands, and decide that a rapid phase out of coal could result in them facing a similar ISDS case. The government may then decide to wait and see what the outcome of those cases is before developing legislation. This is exactly what happened uh, in the area of tobacco labeling. In New Zealand, the government saw that Philip Morris had brought a very large claim against Australia for mandating the plain packaging of cigarettes. Even though Australia eventually won that case, it took many years. And Basically, the argument here is that delay of an effective health policy in New Zealand means more lives lost to lung cancer. And we are all very well aware how little time we have to address climate change. So any cause for delay is a real problem. Second concern I have is that when governments do follow through with fossil fuel phase out policies, they will end up compensating investors more than they otherwise would have, either because they are forced to do so by an arbitral tribunal or because they're negotiating with investors under the shadow of ISTS. So there has been some speculation that the, the shadow of investment arbitration influenced the very generous compensation package that Germany provided coal investors for its phase out plan. When compensation is higher, we have a diversion of public money to fossil fuel investors that should have been in, spent on ensuring a clean and just energy transition for everyone. So with that, I think I'm out of time. Many thanks uh, to everyone for listening. And if you are interested in more detail about compensation and ISDS, uh, please do check out the report that I've co-authored with Lorenzo Cattula at the International Institute for Environment and Development, or IIED. I'm currently working with colleagues at the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University to expand that we did in that report on investment treaty coverage um, of fossil fuel assets. We're going to expand it to the upstream and oil and gas sector, and that research will hopefully be out in the new year. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to all the panelists for, for very good comments uh, on, on both WTO and, and the uh, Investment State Dispute Settlement. Uh, Dirk, I think you have a, a tough job now to, to bring together all this and to, to provide your uh, thoughts on, on the arguments made. So I'd like to introduce Professor Dirk de Bievre, who is a, a professor of international politics and chairs of the chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of Antwerp. As I mentioned, University of Antwerp is one of the partner universities in the Jean Monnet uh, network that is organizing this event. Uh, some of the current research projects uh, that Professor De Bieber is focusing on are related to politicization, politicization of the EU trade agreement negotiations and politics of um, dispute initiation of the WTO. So um, he will provide a brief uh, uh, discussion of the arguments made by uh, our panelists. So. Thank you very much, uh, Krina, and thank you very much, of course, to, to these fantastic uh, uh, three presentations that gave, gave a lot of um, <clears throat> food for thought 
um, and, and were of course of a legal sophistication that is uh, hard to, to emulate. Um, <clears throat> I would like to, to very briefly draw out the main lines out of the, the three presentations and then provide, uh, try to provide a comment that, that bridges them all. So the first uh, contribution by Steve Czarnowicz, I think, is, is important because it highlights uh, an, an issue that, uh, that many of us have not seen coming yet, I think, which is uh, we, are com we are comfortable or we, are, we know uh, from um, the, the, the state of the literature that coming to environmental commitments <laughs> is already very demanding, whether in the WHO or whether in regimes. Second, we know that they are relatively difficult to enforce. That's, and the, the, the reason why we have seen this move um, from, ah, let's enforce uh, environmental commitments through the WHO because they have a very nice enforcement system. No, they have the WHO dispute settlement system. Never mind that it is now a little less performant because the appellate body has been completely uh, uh, killed at least for the moment and for, for a couple of years to come, surely. So let's use the WTO or abuse the WTO dispute settlement system to make environmental commitments more enforceable, right? Those two things are relatively uh, common sense uh, or con are relatively accepted as, as views. And what, what Steve has just added to this list is, of course, that forum shifting may well be a risk for the environmental regimes themselves. And I think that was, that was very, very bright of, of you, Steve, to, to, to make us realize that there are three potential <laughs> sources of danger here. So <laughs> I saw the, the red lights uh, looming in the, in the, at the horizon, whereas at the, state, at, at the moment we're still in front of, a, of an orange uh, middle, like a warning, like, <laughs> let's not do it. <laughs> Maybe we're not going to cross the red light then. So this, then on, on, the, on the contribution of, of Christian Heverly, I would like to ha highlight the, the fact that he has issued a very stern warning here that it is not clear at all yet how this is the legal service of the European Commission or how the lawyers of the USTR or how the WHO uh, specialists are going to try and make sure that there is some leeway and some window of opportunity to make this problem of compatibility somehow uh, solvable. Compatibility between which two things? Well, the differentiation of uh, and, and the, the use of process standards really uh, in domestic legislation and then say, well, we are going to treat your goods differently because they have not been pro they have not been produced in a carbon uh, uh, reducing or, or avoiding uh, way as we are trying to implement in our domestic constituency. So the clash between differentiation and non-discrimination, how to solve it when it comes to process standards. Apparently, especially I'm going to reread, and I think we, we all got that from Christian Heiberly's uh, presentation, we need to reread the Laurent Bartels 2012 source here and to, to, to start thinking about is this now really a stern uh, warning about policy feasibility or is it just a legal issue that can be solved by, by having some deal, right? Those are two, two very different things. And I'll come back to whether this is politically feasible or not in my general comment. Now, and then the, the third thing that I would like to draw out of, of, of the why the, also the, 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 the last contribution was absolutely fantastic. I mean, the, the, the regulatory chill argument about investment uh, uh, arbitration is, of course, also something that we have seen from, from the literature uh, so far. Um, but the distinction that you made about not just sunk costs, but also lost future profits. <laughs> this is quite substantial, and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I, this was new to me. 
I was like, well, probably they can they can fudge that and, and avoid that. And states can say, well, you have, you have no clue about the future, so we're not going to rely on, on, on totally counterfactual constructions of the future. Let's not uh, talk about predictions because they are very difficult, especially about the future, as Churchill used to say, right? But you highlighted that they can even bring that in. Wow. Okay, that's regulatory chill about the future then. So that is a very important uh, observation you made there. Um, and of course, and then we're going to get this delay slowing down of the policy process. Let's wait and see in a strategic interaction game of, of, of states waiting for each other and saying, oh, it's not my fault. It's, it's because the other is still not uh, clear, right? <laughs> That's a classical prisoner's dilemma type of catch in 22 or whichever metaphor you want to use for that type of uh, international cooperation blockage. So... And then the, the last, uh, I, I liked the, the, the little detail about the overpay of compensation that Germany might have been actually doing. I was always thinking like, wow, this is great. No, they, they, they kind of buy out the, the veto players. But you highlight, you put this on its head and you say, no, perhaps other governments are going to find it very difficult to mobilize such huge resources. That's kind of obvious. But you may even say, well, it's actually going to be perhaps counterproductive in the interaction game between different states. So great uh, contributions by all three uh, people here on this panel and, and as they have said themselves i mean this was <laughs> this is a top uh, uh, a top uh, cast of three three top uh, specialists on each topic now what to do <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe 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 there is some critique in in place uh, that, that might that might give us some some optimism about this. Now, the, the way that uh, Steve presented this is that is to say, ah, uh, if um, if there is age, if there had been agency at the WHO, uh, then we might have been in a better place. Yet there is realism that tells us that this is not going to happen anyway. Now, what is agency here? What is the WHO? It's a very basic question, but it's a fundamental question that, that helps us to, to, to make causal inferences about the future and, and try to get explanations about what is happening at the moment. Which is, of course, we know that the WHO as a bureaucracy is not an agency. It's only the negotiations that between countries that produce particular rules and those then have some effects, right? So it's not an agency in any meaningful sense of the of the word nor is it bound to become one uh, it's totally unrealistic so it's different from other international organizations anyway and that's lamy always used to say ah, it's a, it's a, it's just a, the member states right get yeah, a phrase for that uh, I, it doesn't occur to me at the moment doesn't matter um, yet this opens up a possibility to think about wto negotiations as concentric circles. And I think that gets has gotten lost in the last 15 years when people talk about the WTO. They do as if this is a multilateral organization that can be easily blocked by one veto player. That is not the history of the GATT, nor is it the history of the WTO agreements in the Marrakesh package. This came about in club good logic. Think of Ostrom. I mean, coalitions of the willing, people pushing for a particular new type of regulation were started in very restricted groups and then said, well, if you want to join, you can. And if you join, you will get access to a public good, a collective good in the, in the real sense of that Ostrom usage of the word. And so you got these afterwards very maligned green room meetings right but without green room meetings we would not and never have gotten to say the euro gray round regulatory agreements because they were already pre-shadowed by the tokyo round agreements and the very creation of the GATT was also like we are going to create a collective goods for those that are member and you want to join well you will have to accept some of the regulated regulations that we have convened that we have already agreed upon and so this concentric circle logic of attractiveness of being part of the club has been abandoned now in, in, in public thinking, in, a, in diplomatic usage, in lawyer uh, reasonings about this too. Like, well, 
it's because it's too many people, right? And they, and they never agree, and that's why it gets blocked. I'm over, overstating it, of course, and Steve would never use these words, and he didn't uh, either in this presentation today. But you see the contrast. There is some possibility that the club dynamic might actually work if, 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 if they get to solve the problem that Christian Heberly so nicely put, if they get to, to, to a legal solution of the, the, the clash, the incompatibility between differentiation and non-discrimination, transatlantically, through transatlantic cooperation, Steve's last point, then there is a possibility that we again go back to the logic of club goods attracting outsiders into that club and saying like, okay, we would like to accede to your nice new creation of the, the, the reconcilement of environmental and trade concerns within a WTO agreement. It is not inconceivable. And I, still, we, we, we need to realize that the, the, the warning of Steve remains in place, namely that it might hollow out the, the, the regimes, the environmental regimes that we have. Yes, that would still have to be solved too. But it is not inconceivable that the WTO is at, at eternum, totally condemned at total irrelevance, because the club good uh, logic uh, might actually have some traction. And I feel that this has been under um, underappreciated uh, in the last couple of years when people talk about how actually negotiations in the WTO, what determines what determined success in the past in WTO negotiations and in GATT negotiations pre be preceding that, was this club good? There is a brilliant article by uh, Steinberg on this in the international organization. There is the new book by Sapir and, and uh, Mavroidis arguing that this is actually also the the root. They don't use public goods theory explicitly, but actually the reasoning is exactly that. And they say for US and China to, to be able to find some way to, to work together, the best trick to, do, to trigger China into uh, wanting that is for the US and the EU to sort out a couple of things and create club goods in that old fashioned sense. If they agree, on a couple of things, then people will want to climb aboard that ship. That is at least conceivable. So let's not um, uh, leave that out of our reasoning. Um, I, I, I think I want to stop uh, here, just looking at my notes, whether I forgot something that no, uh, the, the only thing that I, I would really like uh, uh, Kila to, to, to elaborate upon, because it, it triggered my curiosity when she was mentioning it, is the failure of this transatlantic energy agreement, which I am unaware of, and I think many of us might also be, uh, because this is this type of shady or, <laughs> or this type of, of agreements that we, we don't have on our radar as, as non uh, field specialists, I would. I think it would be useful for you, Kila, to 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 give a bit more, as you were saying. Like uh, I can come back to that in the Q and A. Please do. 